this series, Unlikely Candidates, uh, we're just starting to get a really good look at some of these very unusual people that God has brought into this whole story surrounding the birth of His Son, Jesus. It's very unusual people in my estimation. Uh, last week we looked at the angel Gabriel, and we looked at how Gabriel was maybe motivated uh, through some of his emotions and, and things uh, to share the good news with these shepherds in the field and, and some of the things that maybe were going through his mind and his heart as he talked with Mary about the coming birth of God's only son. And this week we're going to, again, continue on this journey of unusual candidates, of unlikely candidates, and we're going to look at a guy by the name of Joseph. Joseph is one of these guys that had one of the most phenomenal responsibilities in all of human history, and yet we know so very little about him. So hey, let me introduce you to Move, will you? <laughs> Thanks. There, let's take this paper out. <laughs> you can have it back. My name's Joseph, and I'm just an average everyday guy. I'm a skilled craftsman by trade. I uh, grew up in a family with, you know, regular parents and, and all kinds of just normal things going on. I'm really nobody special. I'm just your average guy. I get to, to do something really unusual, though. I get to be the earthly dad for the Messiah. Oh, you know, I got to tell you something. I had no idea. And by the way, my beard, it was a little longer back then. And I wanted to point out to my wife, see, I can have long hair and not be bald. <laughs> so. But I get to be the earthly father of the Messiah. What a huge responsibility. What pressure, what confusion, what... What do I need to know in order to be a dad? Because I'm not a dad. I've never been a dad before. I'm just a kid growing up, working hard, trying to go to the temple with my family, and, you know, I'm going to get married, and I'm just going to have a, you know, but I don't really know much about being a dad. I've never been a dad before. I mean, that's sac sacrificial. That's, that's caring about this. I don't know. I'm just a regular old guy. I'm just a, I'm poor. I'm a tradesman. I believe in God. I go to the temple with my family. I do all of those things. I'm just, I'm just your average guy, your average Joe. When I first realized that, that this plan of God to have this son this way involved me, I had to, I had to think about it, and I realized how in the world will I ever make ends meet when I'm traveling, when I'm on the move all the time. I thought about, you know, with my trade, and I'm trying to provide for Mary and God's son. It's, how in the world am I going to earn enough money to, to live and to provide food and shelter and all? I mean, if I'm always on the move, people don't know me. They don't know the quality of my work, and, and it's always gonna, I'm always going to get the lower end of the pay scale. It's going to be hard. How do I keep Mary safe when I'm away working, when I'm, when I'm cutting stone or I'm doing a, a, a construction project of some nature? I mean, what do I do? These are the questions that went through my mind constantly. And you know what? For, for one chosen to be the earthly dad of God's son, I felt pretty alone. I felt pretty much like God wasn't even there. Like I was kind of on my own. And then there was 
Mary, the relationship with Mary, it was difficult. It was quite difficult. Many people over the centuries have thought that, you know, oh yeah, they, it was just such a blessed relationship and everything was picture perfect and we just were so deeply in love with each other, you know, but, and it was a rough start because I thought, I thought that this girl that, that I was engaged to, I thought that she was lying. I mean, come on, the stories that she told, they were just too unbelievable. I thought that she was trying to cover something up that was horrible. I felt bad for her in a way, but in another way, I'm just mad. I'm just, phew. And then I turned, you know, I, I believe in God, and I, like I said, I, I always go to the temple with my family, and, and I, I really want to know God deeper and deeper. I'm trusting God. I'm waiting for the Messiah and all that kind of stuff. And I question God all the time when I found out that Mary was pregnant. I couldn't believe that God wanted me to put my whole reputation, my whole life, you know, the, even, even with my family, he was asking me to give up everything for the sake of this girl that I was engaged with, which I loved. I really did. Mary was really a sweetheart. But man, was I really being asked to put everything on the line? I mean, I'd worked hard to get to, I mean, I'm young, but I worked hard and learned hard, too, to get to the point to where I could provide for myself and even think about getting married. I felt like I didn't deserve this. I felt like, you know what, God? Man, I'm, I'm trying my best here. And this difficult scenario you're putting me into? I'm not sure I want it. It's unbelievable. I'm not sure I'm hearing you correctly. And then there was that, that experience that I had with this angel. Oh, my gosh. Believe me. You know, some of the guys and I, we would meet at the temple, and we would, we would go to the classes, and we learned and all, and, and our families got together, and we talked about Scripture, and we read Scriptures and had meals together. And, and sometimes our discussions would be about angels and what angels were like. Man, angels are nothing like what we thought. That dream I had that night, and this angel comes to me, and it was like nothing I could ever explain to you. And you know what? This is what he says. Joseph, son of David. Okay, that's me. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Okay. Really? You want me to bank my whole future, my whole career, my livelihood, the relationship with my family and my brothers and sisters and everything else that's going on in my life, and then end up moving from place to place based on that what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. I couldn't help but wonder, how do I really know that this is from God? There was lots of doubts in my mind. But you know what? The more I thought about it, the more I realized that this conversation I had with this angel through this dream, the angel knew my heart, knew what was going on. He knew some of the complexities that were in there. He knew the doubts. He knew the anxieties that were, that were just streaming through me about what I was getting involved with. So it kind of confirmed this idea that, you know, this dream really did come from God. Now, I got to tell you, life with Mary, it was, it, it was really nothing like I, again, envisioned. It's amazing how life brings you to these places you never imagined. Life with Mary was nothing that I expected. It was uncharted territory, man. It was always challenging. I expected that if I went along with this and I took Mary to be my bride and, and you know, accepted that this was God's son, that God would provide, that he would provide food and shelter and clothing and all of these things that we needed. 
but so many times we just felt so all alone. There was nothing. Sometimes we felt like, like God was so distant, we wondered if he was even there. I got to tell you, I didn't realize at the time, I can look back on it now, I didn't realize at the time what a blessing the hardships that we went through, what a blessing they would be in our life later. I didn't realize how all of the things that were going on around us and within our, our, our family there, how all of those things would bless humankind for centuries to come. I never realized it. When I look back upon it, I see now, you know, a, a clear picture of what God was doing, and it's easier for me to accept what God was doing. But back then, oh man, the doubt, the anxieties, the challenges to accept what was going on and to say that this was from God. You know, you got to understand, in the temple, and when all the guy, we would all go and we would be taught in the temple. We were all taught that when the Messiah comes, well, he's going to come charging in with white horses, and and any oppression that we're under is going to go away, and basically the kingdom is going to be reestablished. You know, the Garden of Eden is going to come back to life, and we're going to be parts of it. And yet, this is like you know, an angel and a, you know, Mary and the baby and. How can this be the plan of God? Makes no sense. As Jesus' earthly father, though things were changing, after the baby was born and I had the experience of being a dad, and I, I started to realize more and more how God was in the midst of the picture. More and more, my heart grew to the point to where I wanted to be in a deeper and a more intimate and a closer relationship with him. Because I felt his spirit starting to calm my anxieties, starting to take some of the doubts and sweep them away. It was still hard. It was still difficult. But you know, one of the most difficult parts of the journey was that there were times that I realized that Jesus was mine. He was my son. I was caring for him. I mean, I was there at the birth. I mean, the whole nine yards. But then there were times when I realized he's not my son. He's so much more. And then Jesus, of course, as he grew older, he was a challenge. The stuff that came out of his mouth, oh my goodness. I mean, it wasn't bad, don't get me wrong. But the things that he said and the way that he presented himself and the, the attitudes that he had and everything was so different from all the other kids. He was special. You could see it right off the bat. The way he cared for people, the way he, he spoke. I mean, there were times that he just baffled us. And baffled some of the religious leaders that we came into contact with. I mean, I knew that this, this isn't my kid, you know. There's something really special going on here. He was certainly a challenge because of his nature, and he was so unique. I remember that day that we lost him. You know, we're, we're traveling in a caravan, and, you know, Jesus is back there with all the other kids, and... You know, everybody's just moving along. It was normal. And then it got later in the day, and, and we realized that he wasn't with us. Oh, man. I felt like the worst parent that day. I felt like I had really disappointed God. I had let him down. You know, I was, you know, chosen to care for his son here in the world, and, and I lost him. I didn't know where he was. I didn't know, you know, had something happened? Uh, was he lost and looking for us, or was he in danger, or had he gotten ill? Or I, I didn't know. I felt horrible that day. But then when we found him, again, that was a time that I realized that Jesus is not so much my son, but really is the son of God because of where he was, what he was doing, what he was saying. 
You see, my role as Jesus' earthly father was simply to nurture him and to bring him up and to teach him the things, the skills and the trades and all that I, that I knew. I mean, I didn't know where his path was going to go. I, everything was so confusing at that part. At that point, and again, I, we thought that Jesus was going to come right, or the Messiah would ride in on a white horse, and, you know, all of a sudden the Garden of Eden is all over again, but it didn't happen. So I didn't know. So I taught him the best that I could. I tried to teach him scripture. Uh, we, we did all the normal things. We taught him trades. He played. I mean, all of these things. You know, the scripture doesn't really say a whole lot about me, Joseph. And actually, the scriptures that you read, they don't even record one word that I ever said. You know why? I've come to realize it's because I'm not important. You guys have said in your church many times, it's not about you. You see, I had to learn that same lesson. I had to learn that lesson the hard way, sleeping on stones, out in the cold, working, wondering if Mary was okay, waiting for God to provide something for us to eat. You see, I'm not important, he is. And one of the biggest challenges that I ever had in my life was to allow God to work because I was taught that in the world that you grow up in, this physical world, it really is your destiny, your livelihood. Everything is in your own control. It's all yours. But you've got to work for it. And what God was asking me to do was so different than what I had been taught. It was so random. It was hard to see God providing and working. But it was also difficult for me because I didn't want to get in God's way, you see? I mean, it was obvious that Jesus and, and the coming of the Messiah into the world was much different than I had ever thought about or it had ever been taught. And I'm like, well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm going to be a problem or get in God's way. I don't, I don't really want to do that. So I had to spend a lot of time soul searching and, and trusting that God would not let me get in his way and that I would be faithful. How do you live for God, always being on the edge? How do you do that? How do you live for God when there's no real guarantees out there? There's no food, there's no shelter, there's no comfort. This journey that he's called me to, this life that he's called me to, is one of the most challenging, difficult things I could ever imagine always fighting these thoughts that I deserve better. But I also had to remind myself that, you know what? I also have been chosen by God, and what an honor that is for me, to be chosen to care for his son. You see, it was, it was later that I became completely convinced that this was God's one and only son, the true Messiah that was coming into the world. And that I had the honor of providing for this child. And that God would never let me miss a beat. That God would make sure that we were safe ultimately. That we always had something to eat ultimately. You see, I'm really nobody special. And this whole experience was, was quite humbling, really. Again, in the scriptures, you don't read a whole lot about me, especially after the time of the temple incident when Jesus was about 12 and we lost him. God's word could have included, I guess, a lot about my life and, and the journey we continued on, but, but again, I'm, I'm not important. What's important is what happened with Jesus. It was one of the, probably the most humbling experiences that that anyone in humankind could ever, ever go through was being, I think, the earthly father of Jesus. It was quite humbling. 
and quite challenging, extremely difficult, dangerous. I get asked all the time, would you do it again? Yeah, I'd do it. Absolutely, I'd do it. No second thoughts. But really, a bigger question is, would you do it? You see, that's the challenging part. As you read the scripture stories about Mary and the birth of Jesus and, and Mary and Joseph and the kings and all of these things that you guys read about, the overall question here is, would you do it? Because I'm nobody special. You know why God chose me? Because I, he knew I'd say yes. He knew eventually I would wake up and say, okay, I get it. And he knew that I did have a heart for him. I truly want to know God. I truly want to love God and serve God. I really do. And he knew that. And he looked down and he said, this is the right time. Here's a person who will say yes and will honor my, honor my request and honor my son and provide to the best of his ability. Again, not because I'm special, but because of who he is. So the question really goes down through the centuries, and that is, would you do it if you were, if you were prompted by the Holy Spirit to do something of that nature, to follow God's call? Would, would you follow? Would you say okay? Would you be willing to go out on a limb, to give up your family and friends? And I mean, Not that he always does that, but that was the case here. My name is Joseph, and you know what? I hope to see you one day in the kingdom of heaven that my son Jesus is providing. 